You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliot, talking this week on being alone with God. First of all, I want to read you a portion of a little leaflet by A.W. Tozer, a man whose writings I greatly admire. He says, The Bible is more than a volume of hitherto unknown facts about God, man, and the universe. It's a book of exhortation based upon those facts. By far the greater portion of the book is devoted to an urgent effort to persuade people to alter their ways and bring their lives into harmony with the will of God as set forth in its pages. No man is better for knowing that God in the beginning created the heavens and the earth. The devil knows that, and so did Ahab and Judas Iscariot. Nobody is better for knowing that God so loved the world of men that he gave his only begotten Son to die for their redemption. In hell, there are millions who know that. Theological truth is useless until it is obeyed. The purpose behind all doctrine is to secure moral action. So I want to talk about a subject I must treat very delicately. It is a very personal matter for each one of us, but it is one with which many listeners have asked me for help. And the subject is the devotional life. How do I do devotions? What do I do? When? Now, I know that many of my listeners do not need this series, and far be it for me to assume that I should advise you. One's devotion to God is territory on which I would certainly fear to tread. But I am asked from time to time, and I'm glad if I can offer some practical suggestions for what is surely an essential element in learning to know and love God. And that is quiet time. Time alone with God. Now what about the when? We have a lot of scriptural precedent for early in the morning. Psalm 5.3 says, In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning I lay my request before you and wait in expectation. When God gave the children of Israel the food called manna in the wilderness, they had to gather it in the morning. And I think of the bread of life, the word of God, as something that we should be gathering in the morning so that we have our portion for the day. Daily bread is spiritual bread as well as physical bread. Start early in the morning, if that's at all possible. And we should read a portion of Scripture. In Exodus 34, 2, we read God's word to Moses, Be ready in the morning, and then come up on Mount Zion. Present yourself to me there on the top of the mountain. And that might be a good word for you and me. Why not be ready in the morning and present ourselves before God? Abraham's supreme test about sacrificing his son Isaac, the Bible tells us that he got up early in the morning. Jacob got up early in the morning. Laban, Moses, Joshua, Samuel, Job, and Jesus got up a great while before day. And the women who got to the tomb, when did they get there? Very early on the morning of the first day of the week. Now, I think that all of us would admit perhaps reluctantly, that matters of real importance galvanize us to get out of bed. Devotions are not likely to be the thing that galvanizes us. If you hear a fire alarm go off, you get up, don't you? And I like what Oswald Chambers said, another one of those tough admonishments of his. He says, get up first and think about it later. Are you a morning person? Well, you know what I think about that? I think that's absolute baloney. 
I don't think there ever is such a thing as a morning person or an afternoon person because God has arranged a world in which people are supposed to go to work in the morning and they're supposed to rest in the evening and sleep at night. So whether or not you are a morning person, and you can continue to hang on to that label if you like it, how about doing what Oswald Chambers says, get up first and think about it later. Gather the manna, burn the incense, offer the sacrifice. The chief priests and the elders came to the decision to put Jesus to death in the morning. What are the important things in your life? Now, I know that I'm speaking to some people who work full-time, and they have to get up in the morning. They don't have a choice. The rest of us, once in a while, may have a choice, and the choice is ours. But I believe with all my heart that the Lord can enable you to do this if you really want to meet God in the morning and set the tone for the day. Lamentations 3.23 says that the Lord's mercies are new every morning. Think about your schedule. Does it prohibit your getting up early? Ask yourself what matters most. Is it because you stay up so late at night that you can't get up early in the morning? We do have the power to arrange our schedules. We do have the power to choose. There are limitations, I realize, but When people would ask my father how he managed to get up between 4.30 and 5 in order to have time on his knees to pray and to read his Bible, his answer was a very simple one. You have to start the night before. And that is going to mean that you're going to have to give up some things that you might enjoy doing and perhaps give up some things that everybody else thinks you ought to do and that the whole neighborhood or the whole church tells you you must do. Think of the advantages of having time alone with God in the morning. God is then the first person that you talk to. It should give you an opportunity to arrange your mind and your heart for a right start for the day. Correcting your disposition. Receiving the guidance that you need. Taking your bearings. Revising your perspective. Placing yourself where you belong with God. Now I have a caution here. I need to ask myself, am I more interested in gaining advantage for myself than I am in acknowledging Jesus Christ as Lord and Master, owner of my life, the one to whom I bow? Do I belong to the have my own needs met school? I had a letter from a lady who said, it's been a long journey for me to graduate from the Have My Own Needs Met school to the Submit school. There is a time-honored, God-sanctified path that the righteous people of old trod upon. Thanks, Jill, for that wording. Doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness are among the things that the Bible is meant to teach us. And back to A.W. Tozer, the point that he is making here is that theological truth is useless unless it is obeyed. Are you reading your Bible so that you can absorb, learn, study, and start to practice theological truth? Tozer goes on to say what is generally overlooked is that truth, as set forth in the Christian scriptures, is a moral thing. It is not addressed to the intellect only, but to the will also. It addresses itself to the total man, and its obligations cannot be discharged by grasping it mentally. Years ago, back in the 70s, I was an adjunct professor at a seminary here in Massachusetts. And it became very clear to me that it was entirely possible for a student, earnest and eager as he might be to get a theological education, it was entirely possible for him to go through that seminary and perhaps graduate summa cum laude without ever applying the truths of Scripture to his life. They were taught the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, They had courses in homiletics and in hermeneutics and all sorts of other things. And 
the application addressing those truths to the total man just seem to be missing. Its obligations cannot be discharged by grasping it mentally. The course that I was teaching was designed to help students realize the necessity of living out day by day theological truth. I believe that an essential in our lives is time alone with God.